Welcome to the Manitowish Waters Historical Society screencast series, Threads of History. We're looking today at the history and evolution of the Manitowish chain, prehistoric influences. To the left-hand side of the screen, you witness evidence of ongoing glaciation that started about 30,000 years ago and lasts until about 10,000 years ago. These glacial effects sculpted much of the lakes, streams, and land surrounding our community. To the right, from the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center near Ashland, a sign reveals mile-thick glacial ice blanketed this land during the Ice Age more than 10,000 years ago. As global temperatures warmed, the ice melted and retreated north the meltwater covering this land under 500 feet of water. Lake Superior was greatly influenced by all the glacial effects and particularly the meltwater. Let's explore what happened. In and around the Manitowish chain, the Chippewa lobe influenced glaciation the most. Glaciers over a thousand feet thick melted more quickly in the late Pleistocene period creating huge glacial outwash, leaving massive glacial sediments along the modern continental divide. If you look at this image from a 1905 resort map, the yellow arrows demarcate the continental divide between the Lake Superior and Manitowish River watersheds. Interestingly, the continental divide plunges south just above Manitowish waters, and then turns back east again, creating a strong proximity to the chain of lakes and influencing their development dramatically. The post-glacier geological regions would then be established about 10,000 years ago, with the Manitowish chain occupying the northern highland region. In 1915, the Board of Geological and Biological Survey created a report that documented the geology of the Manitowish Range, which is a set of bedrock or trap rock that ran from about Waters Meet to Springstead. The analysis of these rocks and this range gives us important insights into how glaciers shaped the Manitowish chain itself. In looking at the document, they focus on the area between Island and Spider Lakes. If you look at the highlighted area in gold, in section 13, Township 42 North, Range 5 East, there is a doubtful exposure of gneiss on the narrows between Spider and Island Lakes. Many residents are aware of this outcropping because it is a significant boating hazard as well. Further, in the red highlight, the geological analysis goes on to say, the blocks may be in place. It is certain that none of the material has been transported a great distance. So these large rocks had been either pushed up from their bedrock area beneath the sediments by glaciers or are actually attached to the Manitowish Range. Looking below, you can see the buoys that mark both the safe passage and the hazards themselves. And they're all part of the rock hazard that was identified in the 1915 geological report. The yellow arrow looking from upstream shows a pile of these rocks. This is why the report said it is doubtful that it is actually attached to the range itself. Nonetheless, the report was clear. These rocks had not traveled very far. Imagine the powerful glacial forces that broke these rocks off and then pushed them to plug or to become settled in the outlet of what is now Island Lake. Thousands of feet of ice 
tons of water swirling for millennia, sculpting the chain. Another revealing element from the 1915 geological report was regarding the development of a mining interest known as F.I. Carpenter. The gold highlight reveals diamond drilling in a number of localities by F.I. Carpenter Syndicate shows clearly the general characteristics of the rocks in Wisconsin. The report utilized the analysis of F.I. Carpenter's mining company and their core samples to extrapolate what was happening well below the surface. F.I. Carpenter, as evidenced by about a 1916 plat book of the Manitouish Waters area, was probably the biggest landholder at that time, except for the state of Wisconsin. And they were doing their analysis to try to find if any of the riches from the Pinocchio or Gibbic range existed here along the Manitouish chain. The importance of this analysis and this land ownership illustrates well that as logging was in transition, other corporate interests were looking at the resources in the Manitouish chain. Go explore the legacy of glaciers, whether by canoe, kayak, or in your pontoon boat. You might discover that lakes along the Manitouish chain tend to have more rocks along the southernmost shores, while the northern shores tend to be sand. This is a glaciation effect here. And if you look at the right from an image from the Wisconsin Historical Society of the Manitouis chain in the 1930s, I've applied arrows that show where rock beds are today along the shoreline. Go see for yourself. Can you find a good number of rock beds on the north side of the lakes? Or will you discover, as I have, that they're almost always sand? This again is another legacy of the glaciation in forming the Manitouish chain. Archeological evidence has documented human occupation and travel routes in our community from 10,000 years ago by the earliest Americans called Paleo-Indians. The retreat of glaciers left windy, dusty, and cold climate for these First Nation people. If you look at this image, of megafauna like mastodons and giant bison. You see the outwash from the glaciers and on the horizon line, you can see the glaciers themselves, thousands of feet thick. This would have been part of the reality of the Manitouish chain for thousands and thousands of years as the glaciers moved forward and retreated. As the glaciers receded, the large mammals became extinct. The warmer climate changed the landscape from tundra and spruce forests to a mix of conifer deciduous canopy. And so animals like the woolly mammoth will fade away and paleo Indians will migrate more toward the north. To the right, you see an outstanding timeline depiction of Wisconsin archeology span provided by the Wisconsin Archaeological Society. Looking at the timeline above, the Manitouish chain had occupation in the late Paleo-Indian period and moves all the way through modern times. The late Paleo-Indian period and early Archaic periods mark an important transition. Archaic Indian traditions and activities reacted to these environmental shifts and moved toward water when water levels dropped. Archaic Indians were less nomadic, living along the lakes and rivers in the chains like Manitouish waters, where they fished, hunted wild game, and gathered food and medicinal plants. The water levels within the Manitouish chain are hard to research within the Archaic period. Modern scholars, both geologists and archaeologists, agree that water levels dropped over a hundred feet during this time. We can extrapolate that the water levels were also lower on the Manitouist chain and thereby native communities seeking water resources and transportation as well as village sites 
may be inundated today by the water of the Manitoulis chain. The transition from archaic to what archaeologists call woodland Indians has four identifying markers. Inventions of the bow and arrow, pottery making, human burials placed in mounds, and the practice of cultivating native and imported plants in family gardens. As you look beneath here, these are artifacts from the Manitouche chain and surveys conducted in the 1990s. To the left, you see arrowheads, small projectile points for arrows, not to be confused with the more numerous spear points discovered on the Manitouche chain. To the right are broken pieces of pottery. These shirts also reveal a strong presence. It's important to note that of all the prehistoric traditions, the woodland tradition has most artifacts associated with it on the Manitouis chain. Woodland Indian culture traditions lasted from approximately 3,000 to 500 years ago and represents the final phase of prehistoric Indians in Manitouis waters. The climate over the past 2,000 years was generally similar to today and the woodland people settled in villages along the lake shore. As you look to these images to the left is an image of a mound, one of those four demarcations of woodland traditions. That mound happens to be located at a state park on Lake Tomahawk. The mound to the right, coated with a little bit of snow to see it better, is found on the Manitouche chain. Garden beds representing woodland, Mississippian, or Oneota traditions have not yet been documented along the Manitouche chain of lakes. Research done by David Overstreet and Mark Brewey, illustrated in these images, shows serious analysis and discovery of garden beds in the northeastern part of the state, in Menominee County and in the Nicolay National Forest. These garden beds, whether the undulations you see to the right with Mark Brewey's excavations or on the Menominee Indian Reservation under Overstreet supervision, reveal these strong traditions. If any resident or visitor to Manitouish Waters discovers features such as witnessed here, please report them to the Office of the State Archaeologist or you can share them with the Manitouche Waters Historical Society, and we will pass that information along to licensed and permitted archeologists to do appropriate and legal review. Laws and best practices regarding cultural resources protect our traditions and heritage throughout the state of Wisconsin, particularly on public lands. Below, you'll see several acts, both state and federal, that try to make sure that we do not lose any more of these precious resources. The Manitouche Waters Historical Society at their webpage has also created a prehistorian archeology span webpage that has cultural resources, best practice question and answers for landowners, visitors, and residents to explore to make sure they are good stewards in protecting these historic and cultural resources. There's also a link there that show both state and federal laws and tribal best practices from Lac de Flambeau. The Manitouche Waters Historical Society hopes you've enjoyed the screencast on the threads of Manitouche Waters history. You can find more information at mwhistory.org, our website, as you can see on the left, and you can find specific images and documents at mwhistory.passperfectonline.com on our online archival site. If you're interested in connecting with the Manitouche Waters Historical Society, you can join our team by going to the link below and filling out a membership form and sending it in. But if you just want to keep up with our events and progress, you can get a free copy of our newsletter sent to you electronically by merely sending your name and email 
to mwhistoricalsociety at gmail.com. Please tune in as we add more to our YouTube web channel and our screencasts.